Section 1. You will hear a telephone conversation in which Francis Drew asks Mr Harding about an arts club. First, read questions 1 to 10. For questions 1 to 10, fill in the missing information on Francis Drew's notepad. Write no more than three words for each answer. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 10. Hello. Hello. Is that Appleton 363? It is. Harding speaking. Oh, um, are you... I mean, I'd like to speak to the secretary of the Arts Club. Yes, speaking. Oh, hello. My name is Francis Drew. I just moved to the area. My classmate and I, and we'd be interested in joining the Arts Club, but we'd like some more information, really. You know, about joining and the sorts of activities you do. Yes, well, what do you want? Our calendar. Ask at the library. I'll make sure that there are plenty there by Thursday. That's all right for you? Yes, fine, thank you. But um, would you mind telling me how much it costs to join? Membership fee for an adult is £2.50 per year, of course. What exactly does club membership entitle one to? Entitle you to? Oh, uh, for a start, there's the uh, club events. You get invited to them, of course. They're for members and only... Um, they are free. What sorts of events are there? I mean... You'll see what they are when you get hold of a calendar. But, well, there's club evening, for instance, once a month, usually Wednesdays from 8 till 10. And whereabouts do you hold them? Club evenings, uh, the, the Beach Pavilion. Do you know it? No, I don't think I do. It's not near the seafront, is it? No, up past the tennis courts on Park Avenue. You know where that is. No, I'm afraid I don't. We'd soon find it, though. Quite good. I don't know what your interests are, Music? Got any musical talents? I'm not sure about talents exactly. I like music. We both do. Do either of you sing? Oh, yes. We've both been in choirs. Well, there you are, then. The club's got a very fine choir. Very fine. I'm in it myself, as a matter of fact. We have practices every Friday evening. And it's no good just thinking of joining if you can't make the practices. No, of course not. But what's the procedure? I mean, if we decide to join the choir or any of the other activities, how do we go about it? You can't get into the choir without an audition. As far as the other sections are concerned, members have to apply through the section secretary in the first place. Yes, right. And the fee again. I've written it down somewhere. £2.50 each. And where do we send it? To you? No, I'm the secretary. It's the treasurer who deals with that. I'll give you his name if you want to write it down. Yes, please. His name is Hosegood. H-O-S-E and then Good. Yes. Initial P. Address 3 Clay Hill, Appleton. Right, and it's all right to send a cheque? That's the usual, yes. Payable to Appleton Arts Club. Appleton, A-double-P-L-E-T-O-N. Oh, and uh, better put your address on the back as you're new. Uh, and incidentally, there's a newsletter out three times a year just to keep club members up to date with what's going on. They, they're they sent to everyone. That's good. Um, Just one last thing. Would you mind telling me what the other sections are so that I can tell my classmate and we... The players, that's our act group, I've told you. Choir, you know about. There's the gramophone circle, the music workshop, the literary and discussion group. Oh, that one meets in different members' homes. Then there's the studio workshop and... Um, what have I missed out? Oh, yes, the art talks. That's the lot, I think. Ah, the film society. That's the other one. Got them all. Ah, oh, yes, just about. Thank you very much. You've been very helpful. Not at all. Pleased to assist. And uh, look forward to meeting you and your classmates at the club. Yes, thank you. Goodbye, then. That is the end of Section 1. You will have half a minute to check your answers. You will hear a talk given to a group of international students about banking. 
First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Hello! Wow! Nice to see all you international students here today. Thanks for coming. I'm Penny from Finance. I wasn't expecting so many. They told me 30, but there must be at least 50. Anyway, for many, if not most of you, this is your first time in Australia. You may find our banking system similar to yours. Anyway, if you have any questions, could you leave them till the end? OK then. Well, step one for most international students is to open an account. Some of you have brought cash over from your country and, having worked with international student accounts for many years, I can tell you that the money often goes missing. Even if only for safety's sake, open a bank account. It's the safest place to put your money. Now, in Australia, we have four main banks, and lucky for you, all four are within walking distance of the school. First off, in Scarborough Street, we have the United Global Bank, or UGB as we call it. Next, we have the International Bank. When you walk into Pacific Plaza, you can't miss the big red sign on your right. The Pacific Bank is located in Key Plaza, just 100 metres down the street, and Town Bank, another international bank, is in Southport Park. Now, one of my jobs in student services is to locate the best bank accounts for our students from the neighbouring banks. I am happy to say that the banks in this area are quite competitive and I've managed to locate three excellent accounts with various pros and cons. The first two are from the UGB. Firstly, the EasySaver account is very popular among international students. The reason for this is the low fees and the 10 ATM withdrawals per month. The other account that does well is the Quick Saver. The main reason for this is because once you open an account, there are no fees for the first six months. No one wants to pay fees, right? Now, the International Bank has what they call a student savings account. This account has been quite successful among our international students as well, especially for those who need a checking facility. The account offers a checkbook at no additional cost to you. The last of the popular student accounts is a study account, which is offered by Pacific Bank. The main advantage with this one is that the account can be linked to a credit card, which can also be helpful for students. Before you listen to the rest of the presentation, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 18 to 20. A lot of people, when they go to a bank to open an account, take with them all sorts of documents. I've seen some students take restaurant bill statements, rental agreements, even video rental cards. Well, these are not suitable for opening a bank account. When it comes to opening an account, just remember the 100-point system. Some items get higher points than others. But basically, you can't go wrong with your passport as the primary form of identification. I think that's worth 75 points. Some students have a driver's license. This is a good secondary form of identification and it's worth 30 points. Another one that works well is a phone bill with your address on it. Any of these items will easily get you the 100 points needed to open an account. OK, that finishes my part of the lecture. That is the end of section 2. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers.
Now turn to section 3. You will hear three students talking about how to spend their time before going to university. First, you have some time to look at questions 21, 21. Listen carefully to the first part of the discussion and answer questions 21 to 23. What's that you're reading, Matt? Oh, hi, Tara. It's an article about taking a gap year before going to university. Is that what you're thinking of doing, then? Well, I hadn't really considered it as an option, but reading this has got me thinking. I'm looking forward to starting at uni, but I wouldn't mind a bit of time to myself first. Hi, guys. What are you talking about? Hi, Sandy. How's it going? Matt's reading about gap years. He wants to put off going to uni. I think a gap year is a great idea. I'm definitely thinking about it. Are you? What would you do with the year? Well, the programmes I've looked at involve volunteering of some kind. I wouldn't want to just go travelling for a year. I can afford that anyway. The idea would be to work and help people, but more importantly, to grow up and come back knowing more about the world than I do now. Obviously, I'd choose somewhere hot and sunny. <laughs> so... What exactly is volunteering? I mean, OK, I understand it means doing something for nothing, but what does it mean in terms of a gap year? Yeah, it means working with programmes in countries where people need support or some kind of aid. Hmm. I bet your mum and dad aren't quite as enthusiastic as you are about all this. On the contrary. They're really supportive. They can see all the pluses. They realise that I don't know exactly where I want to be in ten years' time. They think it'll give me time to figure things out and not make decisions I might regret later. Now listen to the next part of the discussion and answer questions 24 and 25. I think I'd be worried about how the university look at it, though. But don't you think it suggests you're just putting off studying? Definitely not. Our tutor told us that a lot of universities encourage students to take a gap year. They see a year away growing up and maturing as an asset. Students arrive in higher education with an extra year of life experience, depending on what you do with the time, obviously. Yes, I can see that tutors might like having a few well-travelled students around. I mean, ones that have a more developed perspective. I think they also appreciate that students who come back from a year away, doing something worthwhile, have a stronger sense of direction and a clearer idea of what they hope to achieve. They probably speak at least a few words of another language, too. The most important thing for the unis is that students are motivated. So, anyway, what does your article say about the options? Do they suggest where students should go on their gap year? You now have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 26 to 30. Well, apparently, Australia's the country where the highest percentage of students take a gap year, and it's the most popular destination for gap year students from other countries as well as Britain. Mm, I like the sound of a year in Australia. Mm, they say here that there are three main attractions. The abundance of great coast, beautiful beaches, learn to surf, all that stuff. Then there's the amount of time you can spend enjoying outdoor activities, like hiking and loads of sports. And thirdly, the cosmopolitan cities, especially Sydney, which apparently is awesome. It's a great country for young people because there's so much to do. Loads of adventure <laughs> and sunshine, obviously. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Unfortunately. It says here the cost of getting there in the first place can be prohibitive. However you make your way there, it's expensive. <laughs> Unless the bank of mum and dad help out, that is. Then, look, 
they also mention various places in Africa, but they single out Ghana. Students can get involved with the construction of new schools or teaching the kids that are already in them. That does sound really rewarding and interesting, I have to say. I guess there's a huge sense of achievement with something like that, and you get fantastic life experience from living in another culture. I think you pick up some real practical skills too, skills you can bring back with you. Another place I really like the sound of is Nepal. What's the attraction there? Most of the volunteering involves teaching again, and it's that sense of achievement that people are after. They also say,、uh, let me read it.、Uh, students are attracted by the simplicity of daily existence. I think they mean you have to spend a year without your computer and all the rest of it. It's all about going back to basics. So where do people stay? They live on farms or in mountain retreats.、Mm, I'm not so sure I could manage that. I don't mind hard work, but I like a hot shower at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, I imagine the food's not great either.、Uh, they do actually say here that one of the things volunteers miss is good food choices. Anyway, there are plenty of other options. Why don't you read the rest of the? That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of section three. Test one, listening. Section four. You will hear part of a lecture about a place called Kuba Pedi. Listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to thirty-six. Good afternoon. Today we're continuing this series of talks on the development of the Australian outback with a look at Cooper Pedy, the desert town of opal mines and underground living, which lies 860 kilometres north of Adelaide and 690 south of Alice Springs. The inaccessibility, harsh climate, and almost total lack of water made it a highly unlikely place for human habitation. But that all started to change in 1915, with the discovery there of opals, the precious stones which seem to change colour according to their surroundings. Settlements were established following the First World War, when soldiers returning from the trenches of France brought with them the techniques of living below ground in dugouts. The depression of the 1920s and 30s led to many prospectors leaving. But the town boomed again in the late 1940s, when shallow new opal fields were discovered, and immigrants from Europe arrived in large numbers after the Second World War. It must be remembered, though, just how hostile conditions were. Daytime summer temperatures reached well over 50 degrees centigrade. Winter nights were bitterly cold, and dense dust storms regularly blanketed the town. To cope with this. More and more people began living in disused mines and purpose-built subterranean houses, where the temperature remains at a comfortable 25 degrees all year round. So that eventually, around 70 percent of the town's inhabitants had made their homes beneath the surface. This led to the construction of hotels and even churches below ground, as well as an entire underground shopping centre, the only one in the world. Test one, listening, section four. Now answer questions thirty-seven to forty. Perhaps not surprisingly, this has now led to the emergence of a secondary industry, tourism. 
increasing numbers of visitors come to see the tunnels and the caves with their ventilation shafts, the weird machines lying about in the town, and just beyond it in the scorched red desert, the conical hills thrown up by the world's biggest opal mines. It's a logical stopping place for travellers too. The nearest town to Cooper Pedy is Woomera, in the prohibited area once used for launching space rockets. But even that is an enormous distance away. Within the town itself, there are plenty of hotel rooms and a number of ethnic restaurants. Remember that Cooper Pedy is one of the most multicultural places in Australia, with an estimated 45 nationalities represented, and its very own Opal Museum. A short distance from town, there's a section of the enormous barrier that runs thousands of kilometres across the country. The dingo fence, which is meant to keep these predatory wild dogs out of the sheep farming areas. Another attraction just outside town are the sets of various films made there, including Mad Max 3, as well as The Red Planet and Until the End of the World. Names that reflect the harshness of the terrain and temperatures there. The name Cuba Pedy, incidentally, comes from an Aboriginal expression meaning white man's hole in the ground. Next, I'd like to go on to talk about Broken Hill, another mining town, but one that... That is the end of Test 1.